Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me on Table Talk. Welcome, welcome. This is a program where we dive uh, into deeper uh, topics of uh, the Bible and uh, those hard uh, to understand verses, and we kind of pluck them out and dissect them a bit, and I absolutely love to do that. I am Yvette Gallinar, and my husband and I are the founders and senior pastors of Word of Faith Global Ministries. So we thank you for listening today. And I have a super, super special guest, and it is an honor to have someone that I've been following for quite some time, a few years, I would say. And uh, I've gleaned so much from this person that you see before me. Uh, so my special guest Derek Gilbert. Welcome to Table Talk, Derek. It's so good to yeah. have you. Uh, thank you, Yvette. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. I have a little bit of a bio that I want to read to the audience. So if you don't <laughs> mind, I'll read that because while I was um, searching as to what to say about you, I thought, oh, let me check his website. And man, this is good. So I'd love to share that with everybody so that they know who we're speaking to. And I want to show a little bit of your work as well, because I do have some of your uh, books. But Derek P. Gilbert hosts the Daily News Analyst uh, Analysis Program 5 and 10, which I listen to all the time. I love that. Uh, we should have that actually out there in the news is what we should have. The 5 and 10 <laughs> program. I think they would ban you within five minutes time. Just my take. <laughs> That's why we're not on YouTube anymore. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so five and ten for Skywatch TV, which I love. Skywatch uh, TV and co-hosts Sci Friday and Unraveling Revelation, another all-time favorite of mine. Um, together with his wife, and author and analyst uh, Sharon Gilbert, which I have to say I would absolutely love to have both of you on a table talk. So maybe we can talk about that at some other time. Sure. Would love that. Uh, but Derek is the author of the groundbreaking books, Bad Moon Rising, On the Role of Islam in the End Times, The Great Inception, and Last Clash of the Titans. He and Sharon have co-authored Giants, Gods, and Dragons, a fresh take on end time prophecies that names the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Ooh. And also Veneration, which exposes the influence of the pagan cult of the dead in ancient Canaan and on Bible prophecy. I'd like to probably touch on that a little bit today, hopefully. But Derek also co-wrote uh, The Day the Earth Stands Still with uh, Josh Peck, which I also follow and I like his, um, his uh, material as well. But that is a timely book on the modern UFO phenomenon that exposes for the first time the occult origins of the belief in ancient aliens. And that's another topic of conversation that I'd love to pick your brain on at some point in time. But his latest is The Second Coming of Saturn, and you can see that behind his screen. And it's a startling book that connects the Roman god Saturn, the Canaanite cult of Molech, the global reset, and, a, and occult symbolism inside the United States Capitol. Wow. All of which <laughs> are amazing topics. I have to say, and I showed Derek this off camera earlier, but I've got some of his material here. I've got uh, Giants, Gods, and Dragons. I've got Last Clash of the Titans. That was an amazing, amazing book. Uh, the Great Inception as well. And uh, look at this one, you guys, Veneration right here. So uh, these are some of the materials that I brought with me because I wanted to show it to our audience that's actually watching. We're on uh, podcasts as well, but those are actually watching. Um, anything you want to say about any of that material that I just mentioned? It's just that, uh, you know, as I look back over my life, I, if I had when I came out of college back in 1984, I was a radio broadcaster in the secular world. In fact, top 40 radio broadcaster, because when you're, you know, 22 years old, nobody needs a talk show host who's only 22 because you're, you're stupid. You don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you may not be stupid, but you don't have enough life experience to right, really understand right, what's going on. Right. So um, anyway, I, I was on that track. And if I had looked back, you know, look forward 40 years to, to where I am now. Um, I, I would have thought, you know, something traumatic had happened in, in between. But right. what really happened is the Lord was preparing me in a very non-traditional way 
for what we're doing now. So the broadcast experience, the um, the, the fact that I'm the uh, the son of a of a school teacher and an engineer. So you've got on the one hand a father who wanted to figure out how things worked and design ways of making them better, and on the other hand, a woman with a heart to teach. And I can definitely, I can definitely say I, I am my my parents' son because I think that's come together in the way the Lord has designed this weird wiring inside my head. Um, I love that. So taking dad's uh, desire to figure out how things work and mom's desire to teach, and uh, that's really where we are today. That's a great combination too. That's exactly right. And God just wired you that way with your parents that uh, he gave you. That's amazing. Are you ready to dive right in? Absolutely. All right. Um, although some of the material that um, we have shared that you've written about and and uh, on the programs that you've been, I've heard you on many, many podcasts, uh, but Skywatch is my go-to. I love to listen to uh, all of the Skywatch programs. Um, but some of this material might be new to some of the people in the audience, right? Um, I never want to um, take for granted that everybody knows, you know, the things that we're talking about. Not necessarily. I mean, you might you might say the word Nephilim or the name Nephilim and some people have no clue, be that a Christian or not, you know. But in any case, um, I want us to get into these topics because I'm sure that um, as we do, as it happened to me years ago when I began to dig deeper and listen to, you know, programs like, like yours and read uh, the materials that you've brought forth, it all begins to make sense. And what I mean by that is that the Bible begins to make more sense. Um, I, I wanted to read an excerpt from Giants, Gods, and Dragons, if you don't mind. Um, this is in chapter five, the beginning of chapter five, which I love how you quote Dr. Michael Heiser at the top of this, but you wrote this and then we could go into it a little bit. And I know this is kind of deep, even, even, even though, um, you know, the audience might not fully understand, but I, I want to go right into it, you know, uh, but you wrote in this chapter um, that's entitled More Lying Rebels, the Abkalu, Gilgamesh and the seven, 70 Sons of El. OK, so this is what you wrote. You said. The ancient records are rife with references to pantheons the, um, that, that imitate, I'm sorry, I don't have my reading glasses, I should have gotten them, that imitate the true divine assembly of our Lord and Savior, Baal or Baal, right? El and El's 70 sons are one example. Each pantheon, which the number 70 is very interesting, right? Each pantheon is said to dwell upon the sacred mount, a sacred mountain, whether natural or man-made, Babel being one such example. And then you go on to say these pre precipitous and lofty stones, uh, thrones, sorry, throne rooms could be found across the globe, including, and then you name several of these mountains, Mount Savon, um, let's see, Mount Olympus, uh, Mount uh, Kilash, uh, Mount Kobru, Kobru uh, Mount Carmel, and some of these mountains, actually, I talked in a recent table talk with Dr. Laura Sanger. I don't know if you're familiar with her work, uh, but she wrote a phenomenal uh, book, and I'll, I'll have to share that with you um, from Dr. Laura Sanger. But anyway, you write here, uh, but as we study the long spiritual war between Yahweh and the fallen realm, we also find ourselves returning to Mount Hermon or Mount Hermon the place where the watchers descended and took an oath before cohabiting with human women and producing giant offspring. For it is also where El held court with the consort Asherah and his 70 sons. So that's a mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. Help us understand who the fallen realm are and what their end goal is. Sure. Credit where it's due, by the way, Sharon wrote this portion of the book. Right. She is a much more, she is a much more elegant writer than I am. When we write together, and one of the reasons we wrote Giants, Gods, and Dragons was 
to explain to believers mainly, but you know, we, we pray that this reaches unbelievers, non-believers, yeah. but to believers specifically that these entities, and, and that's the reason, by the way, for the very Lord of the Rings-ish cover on the book. Uh, it looks like one of the one of the orcs on, on the cover. Uh, Jeffrey Martis, our cover artist, did just a, uh, just an incredible job Amazing. with uh, with uh, the design. He's done all of our book covers, including all of Sharon's uh, Red Wing saga series mm -hmm. of supernatural fiction. Right. Anyway, um, it was to show believers that uh, God, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, right. has called these entities in the Bible giants, the Nephilim, gods, the gods of the pagans like Baal or Baal. Uh, Asherah, Molech, and uh, dragons like Leviathan, the multi-headed dragon of chaos, Satan, the seven-headed dragon of Revelation 13. We are Revelation 12, excuse me. We, we see these entities, these, these references in scripture, um, the description of Leviathan, for example, in Job chapter 41, and we try to find naturalistic explanations for them. Oh, he's describing a hippopotamus or an alligator or a crocodile. Um, no, God refers to these entities in these terms. Why are we not taking his words seriously? In fact, what really inspired the book was a, a news story uh, coming back to Lord of the Rings that the developers of the, the, the role-playing game, um, uh, um, oh, now I'm forgetting what is it, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, oh, yes. were upset were upset that the orcs were always depicted as evil because, well, it's clearly because they have colored skin, sometimes green, brown, whatever, they're all you know, colored skin. The elves who are usually depicted as very fair haired and light skinned are always good. Yeah, but in the Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's world of Lord of the Rings, that's just how they were. They represent the loyal angels, the elves, and the fallen angels, the orcs. Right. They are, that is who, what they are fundamentally, good and evil. But these people playing this game took this so seriously, they were rising up in protest. And so we were laughing about that and saying, isn't this silly? They're taking this fictional world so seriously that they're actually actually protesting for the rights of these fictional characters created by J.R.R. Tolkien. Wow. But then we step back and said, but wait a minute. Most of us in the Bible, and this is showed survey after survey by George Barna of Arizona Christian University, who's been surveying what Christians in America believe for decades now and find that more than half of American Christians don't believe that Satan is real. In fact, 60% of American Christians don't believe the Holy Spirit is real. I mean, forget about demons, forget about dragons, forget about giants. Nobody really believes in those things. Well, but God does. It's in his book. So if we say we are followers of Christ and we believe in the Trinity that Christ is God, then he's the one who inspired through his spirit, you know, the third member of the Trinity, the prophets and apostles to write what they wrote. Why are we treating these real entities yeah. as though they're fiction? I mean, we're laughing at these guys treating fictional characters like they're real. Here we are, we've got this, the word of God, and we're ignoring his word and treating those real characters as though they're fiction. So is it any wonder that children are falling away from the faith when the great enemy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I should say enemies, plural, because it's clear when we get into Scripture that there are more than one, which is the other point of the book, Giants, Gods, and Dragons. Right. Um, it's not just Satan, but Satan and a bunch of minions right. who have aligned themselves against God. We don't take God's word seriously because we don't believe the enemy is real. So how, how seriously will we, will we take this supernatural war in which we all take a part if we don't believe it's really real, if evil is nothing more than a construct, if reality doesn't, if, if there is no truth, no ultimate truth, as Pontius Pilate said, you know, what is truth? Right. Well, there is ultimate capital T truth. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Um, but we're living in a world today where generations now have come up through an educational system that teaches there is no ultimate truth. Truth is however you feel, yeah. And so in that kind of a world, our kids who've been soaking in this kind of an intellectual uh, toxic stew are, are setting all of this aside. And so um, the reality of the situation is this. When we go back to what the prophets and the apostles knew about the world around them, 
and see how that's reflected in scripture, we see that these giants, gods, dragons are real. The world around ancient Israel, the prophets and the apostles knew that their neighbors believed that their creator God named El, not to be confused with El Shaddai or El Elyon, right, right. El, the creator God of the Canaanites, was a different entity altogether. In fact, I show in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, how we can identify this character all through history. El of the Canaanites was Saturn of the Romans, Kronos of the Greeks, Molech to the Hebrews. And you can trace them all the way back to the leader of the rebellion in Genesis chapter six, I believe, the head of this group of sons of God who rebelled against their creator. The Canaanites believed that their creator God, El, along with his son, Baal, the storm god, who was Zeus by a different name, uh, Asherah, the consort of El, and the 70 sons of El would meet. It was sort of like a Canaanite Mount Olympus, I think is the easiest way for us to get our heads around this. Mount Hermon, which is on the northern border of Israel today, it's the border between Israel, Syria, and Lebanon. That's where the pantheon of the Canaanites would meet. This was their Olympus. And um, the number 70 in the ancient Near East, not just for the Israelites, but all throughout you know, ancient Mesopotamia, that number 70 represented the complete set, all of them. In other words, all of the gods of the nations would meet on Mount Hermon to hear El you know, decree whatever was to be. Even though Baal was the king of the pantheon, El was the father of all of the gods. And this is where they met. And that is why when we start looking at why certain things happened in the Bible, we begin to notice that these references to Mount Hermon and the region around Mount Hermon, which was called Bashan, mm -hmm. show up and they were always supernaturally charged. Jesus declared his divinity at Caesarea Philippi. That is at the foot of Mount Hermon. That's where he asked Peter that all-important question, who do you say that I am? Yeah. And when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus said, yes, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this has not been revealed to you by men, mm -hmm. but by my Father in heaven. God himself confirmed it to Peter. Mm -hmm. And then he said, Jesus said, on this, I, I say that you are, Petros, you are Peter, right. and on this, this rock, this Petra, little wordplay there, right. this rock, this 9,200-foot mountain right behind me, I will build my church. In other words, on the pagan Mount Olympus, the Canaanite Mount Olympus that we're standing at the base of, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, which is this really big cave over here called the Grotto of Pan, yes. which according to the first century Jewish historian Josephus was literally believed to be the entrance to the netherworld. Right. And Josephus wrote that no one had ever been able to lower a plumb line long enough to hit bottom. They thought the cave had no bottom because it literally extended into the underworld. Wow. And Jesus said, the gates of hell. And everybody knew what he was talking about because they were standing right in front of it. Right. They knew. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So now, if this was all just mythology, if the gods of the pagans around ancient Israel were just their imaginary friends. Right. God would have said to the prophets and to the apostles, look, you're wasting your time sacrificing to, because they don't even exist. But that's not what he said. Right. When God was freeing the Israelites from Egypt, he was freeing them from the hand of Pharaoh. He said to Moses, on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and I will execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Right. And Psalm 82 is like a courtroom scene in heaven where God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, takes his place in the midst of something called the divine council. And this was at the heart of the research of our, our friend, the late Dr. Michael Heiser, the idea that there was like a heavenly court around God. Mm -hmm. God takes his place in the midst of the divine council. And then it says, in the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. And I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting the, the, the translation exactly, but essentially he tells these lesser Elohim, mm -hmm. these other members of the spirit realm, because you have judged unjustly, like men you shall die. Though you are gods, all of you, sons of the Most High, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. God was passing judgment on these entities for not administering his creation justly. And uh, the only way people who, and 
I, I will admit that understanding Psalm 82 in that way is not what's taught at most seminaries today. Right. Most seminaries teach their pastors that, well, this is a reference to the judges of Israel who were not judging his people fairly. That's not how Jesus took it in John chapter 10. When you understand John, or rather Jesus, reference to Psalm 82 in John chapter 10 correctly, right. you understand that Jesus was using this to say, look, um, I can claim to be the son of God, the son, because there are other entities in that realm. Uh, which was the understanding of Jewish theologians in the first century. They understood that there was a second power in heaven, the angel of Yahweh in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. Um, it was only after the second century when Christians had really begun to spread the message that, hey, we know who the angel of the Lord is. It's that Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified under Pilate and then rose again from the dead, that Jews began to teach that there was no second power in heaven and uh, change the understanding that, there, the, 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 you know, God is, is one, there is no, you know, God did not have a son. Any, anyway, I'm starting to ramble a little bit, but the bottom line is this, there's more in the spirit realm. There are more entities active in the spirit realm than we've been taught. Right. And they, like us, were created with free will and right. this long supernatural war between them, the fallen, and the loyal angels. Yeah. And then in the human realm, those of us who've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and those who are following another path is uh, all about who will be raised up at the last trump. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so much in that that I wish I had five hours with you to pick your brain and ask you a ton of questions just so people can understand. I think that the... Um, the hang up that maybe, and that might be a bad word to to use or bad phrase to use, but um, maybe what a Christian would find difficult to understand is that there was this angelic realm that rebelled against God, right? Yeah. Um, because in the mindset of, you know, uh, of a person who follows Christ, maybe they imagine, you know, if, if, if they're angels and they're there with God and the presence of God continually, how could they have rebelled against God? And so I think that that might be right. The, the hang up, that's the only word I can think of, or, you know, the, well, the hindrance. I, I think a lot of us have been taught that angels really don't have free will. Yes. There that, you go. Uh, they, they, they are all created and, and have to serve him mindlessly. Um, but that, that's really not the case. I mean, we see in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, God, didn't, God did not spare angels when they sinned, right. but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Right. So we know that angels can, in fact, we see a, a, another reference to that same event in Jude, verses 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. So we know that angels can sin. And if, that sin, if they can sin, it means that they can exercise free will to choose between right and wrong. Now, what's really interesting about the uh, verses in 2 Peter and in Jude is that uh, um, the word translated hell into English is uh, Tartarusus. It's not Hades. Right. So we're not talking about Hades or Sheol, where the spirits of the dead would go, but Tartarus, which was a separate level. This is the abyss, the bottomless pit, which yeah. is the only place in the Bible where that uh, Greek word is used. And uh, as Mike Heiser used to say, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's probably important. Oh, yes. In context, 2 Peter 2 and Jude 6 and 7, describing these sinful angels, make it clear that their sin was a sexual sin. Right. And, you know, as weird as it seems, especially right. if you've never heard this concept before, um, Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4 describe an illicit union, an unauthorized union between the divine, these right. sons of God, angels, and the daughters of men, human, women. And right. from that union were produced these hybrid, half-human, half-divine creatures called Nephilim, who were believed to be giants. Um, now, there are a number of objections that are raised by people who, who don't believe, don't accept this. And again, I'll say that this understanding of Genesis chapter six is not what's taught in most seminaries. Right. Although I will say that most Bible scholars for about the last century or so now accept that Genesis six, that that's what it means. It literally yeah. means angels came down and cohabitated with humans. Right. Um, but it's weird. 
And so to avoid pastors getting into a difficult situation of explaining, well, how is it possible for an angel to have to have sex with a human? Right. Well, you know, we don't really know how or why that works. All we know is that in scripture, it's it's there. Yeah. The phrase translated sons of God, Beneha Elohim, always, always, always in Hebrew means supernatural beings. Uh, the, the critics who want to say or, or that, no, that's not what that means. It's like, well, I'm sorry, but that's what it means in Hebrew. Yeah. That's just what it means. You cannot redefine the words because you don't like the theological implications. Okay. That's what it means. And when you understand then that that incident, and this is not just known from Hebrew, but from Canaanite texts that have been discovered over the last hundred years, uh, when you add that as context, sort of cultural and religious context of the world around ancient Israel, you see that that event led to the neighbors of the ancient Israelites believing in the spirits of these long dead, mighty men, kings who could be summoned through necromancy rituals. Mm -hmm. The Canaanites called them Rephaim, and we see that term in the Bible. It's actually more, it's in the Bible more frequently than we think, because most of the time it's not translated as a proper name as it should be, it's translated as the dead or the departed or the shades or something. Okay. Um, but they were known to the Canaanites. And about 20 years ago, a, uh, a scholar from Estonia named Amar Anus showed etymologically, I mean, from language, that the Greeks knew the Rephaim and that the demigod heroes of the Greeks were actually the Rephaim of the Amorites and the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Heracles, I mean, we know that, okay, he's the son of Zeus, an immortal woman. Mm -hmm. By definition, that means he's half human, half divine. So yeah, from a biblical perspective, that means he's one of the Nephilim. But Dr. Anus showed that, yeah, but the Greeks understood that that was the origin of the term used for men who lived during the golden age when the demigods walked the earth. It comes from the Canaanites and the word for Rephaim. So this religion, you can trace the religion of the Greeks and Romans back to the Canaanites, which you can actually connect to Mesopotamian beliefs. We go into this and we cite a lot of uh, scholarly sources. Most of them are secular sources in veneration, giants, gods, and dragons, second coming of Saturn, just to show that we're not making this stuff up. Uh, just as Ryan Peterson did, as Mike Heiser did in his books, like Reversing Hermon and uh, The Unseen Realm. This is well known to Bible scholars. But again, the seminaries aren't teaching this to pastors because it's weird. Right. It's weird. And it's easy for, for secular skeptics to look at this and say, oh, sure, look at this now. They're teaching angels and humans, you know, uh, hooking up. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry, but that's what the Bible <laughs> says. Yeah. Okay. We're not trying to make this up. And this led to a cult of venerating the dead, venerating the, anse nice. the ancestors. Uh, that's what our book Veneration is about. And we show in that book how this influenced the Israelites. This is why we get some passages in Isaiah where he condemns the Israelites for um, uh, carrying on um, amongst the, the terebinths or the oaks uh, or eating forbidden food amongst the tombs. Um, strange reference like uh, the son of, of David, Absalom erecting a pillar for himself in the Valley of the Kings, for he had no son to keep his name in remembrance mm. because it was believed by the Canaanites who lived around them that if you didn't summon your deceased ancestors every month on the night of no moon to feed them with a ritual meal, they would cease to exist. If you forgot their names, they would cease to be. Uh -huh. So this is all through the Bible when you know what to look for. And uh, it continues to this day with uh, cultural Yes. Well, religious celebrations like the Day of the Dead in Mexico, uh, in Madagascar, where people will go to the tombs of their ancestors every few years and take out the bodies and rewrap them and give them gifts and offerings and dance with the bodies of their ancestors. Because if they don't, they believe the spirits of those ancestors will come back to cause them trouble. And we can trace this back through the pagan practices of the neighbors of ancient Israel. And that can be traced all the way back to Mount Hermon in that very weird section of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter six. Does this have any connection with Catholicism? And the reason I ask that, I was born and raised Catholic up until I was about 
maybe 19 years of age. I gave my life to the Lord together with my husband on a resurrection Sunday. Um, shortly after giving my life to the Lord, um, you know, I, I obviously I had grown up in the, in the Catholic church, but, uh, they do something where, um, if you want to pray for those that have died, those that have passed on, uh, you basically, you know, talk to the priest or someone, you know, up there and you give them the name and you pay a certain amount and they have what's called a mass, right? A misa, a mass. And you pray for that person, obviously, because they believe in purgatory, right? And so would that, does that connect at all? In, in a sense, it does. And this this entered into the church very early, even before right. the Church of Rome was really the dominant church in um, in Christendom. It, it took, you know, six or seven hundred years for the Roman Catholic Church to become the church that we think of. Um, but as early as the fifth century AD, Augustine, who ironically was instrumental in um, changing the theology of, of the Christian church, because until the time of Augustine in the early 400s, it was it was the consensus that Genesis chapter six means what it says. Yes, angels mated with human women produced these spirits, uh, produced these giants right. whose spirits became demons after they were destroyed in the flood of Noah. When you read the early church fathers like uh, Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Athenagoras and Pseudo Clement and uh, a, a number of others, it's yep. clear this was the default understanding, and they they understood also the overlap between that and the stories of the Greeks, where the old gods, the Titans who were banished to Tartarus, were the sons of God from Genesis chapter 6. Okay, that's just the way it was. I mean, Jesus, even in, in the New Testament, by the way, Matthew 12, verses 22 through 26, when he's confronted by the Pharisees saying he's casting out demons by the power of mm -hmm. Beelzebul, Baal the prince, Jesus said, if Satan cast out demons by his own power, how will Satan's kingdom stand? Oh, okay, so Baal is Satan, and everyone knew that Baal and Zeus and Jupiter were the same entity by different names. So um, it, it was. Th there is a lot of overlap between Greek mythology and the Bible, yeah. but because the early Christians would not stop this practice of summoning their ancestors for a monthly you know, ritual meal, they saw it as more of a cultural thing, even though the leaders of the early churches yeah. around the Mediterranean were saying, look, we don't do that anymore. This is not how it works. The spirits of the dead do not come back to interact or intercede, interact with us and intercede for us. They wouldn't stop doing it. Right. Scholars have found that when they, uh, when when Constantine legalized the the uh, Christian faith in the early fourth century, the 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 first Christian churches built in Rome in the early three hundreds were built in the middle of cemeteries. Mm because they wanted to continue this practice of summoning the ancestors and having this ritual meal. In fact, St. Peter's Basilica, which is on the grounds of the Vatican, is built in the middle of an ancient cemetery. Right. So this practice wouldn't stop. So 100 years later, uh, Augustine comes along. He said, OK, well, look, the spirits of the saints, the, the righteous men and women who have gone on before us can also intercede for us so we can pray to them and we can, you know, dot, dot. Uh, like I said, it's ironic that he is the one who brought the, the practice of praying to saints and asking the saints to intercede, um, which derives from this veneration of the Rephaim, the spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood. Uh, he's also the one who got the church to stop teaching that Genesis 6 meant what it meant and that the sons of God from Genesis 6 were not spiritual beings, um, angels, if you will. They were the righteous sons of Seth who cohabitated with the evil daughters of Cain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is that is still still what is being taught in seminaries today, even though even though theologians kind of have abandoned that sons of Seth theory about 100 years ago. Wow. Well, that's interesting. I'm glad the, that some eyes are being opened uh, with regards to that. You know, I hope that more more will um, help help us. Help us dissect this a little bit. So the this angelic realm that rebels against God, the fallen, cohabitate with the daughters of men. This hybrid race called the Nephilim show up. They are uh, tall, evil, 
horrid looking God only knows what the world looked like at the moment that God had to find only Noah and his family to save what was left and the flood comes. What happens to those Nephilim and what happens to those fallen? Because as you described, the the um like in Jude and in uh first Peter, second Peter, I think it was that uh that we talked about, but they are they are now in Tartarus. In other words, the right, the angelic rebels are in Tartarus, they're chained in Tartarus. Mm -hmm. What interaction do they have? with humanity now and what happened to the Nephilim, the spirits of the Nephilim? Really good questions. In, in a nutshell, here, here will be about 5,000, 6,000 years of human history in, in a nutshell. <laughs> um, when you ask a Christian today, why is the world in such a mess? Yep. Christians will answer, okay, because Adam and Eve sinned, the fall right. in the garden. Right. If you were to ask a Jew in the first century, Okay, the time of Jesus and the apostles, they would say, yes, that was important. But then you also had the Genesis 6 incident where the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were fair and took wives of any they chose. And uh, the giants were in the earth in those days. And also after that, whenever they went into the daughters of men. And that, that word, by the way, that says when in Genesis 6 verse 4 can also be translated whenever they went into right. the daughters of man. Right. Then you had the, uh, the Genesis 11 Tower of Babel incident. Mm hmm so there were like three rebellions. Sharon and I would uh, add there's probably a fourth rebellion in Genesis 1 verse 2, which is uh, chaos. Okay. God's doing chaos with his spirit hovering over the deep, but we'll set that one aside. Um, we'll call that uh, rebellion zero. Um, <laughs> so three rebellions, Genesis 3, the fall in the garden, Genesis 6, Mount Hermon, or the Genesis 6 incident where the giants were created, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. So after the flood, okay, you've got the fall, uh, Genesis 3, the serpent. I, I'm okay with that being Satan, even though the Bible isn't explicit in saying so. Uh, I'll accept that that is Satan in the garden who tempts Adam and Eve. They're kicked out of the garden, and um, for our own good, actually, because if we were to live forever in our fallen state, humans, that is, right. if the transhumanists get their will and we somehow manage to overcome death and live forever in a fallen state, that sounds more like hell than heaven to me. My goodness, yes. Genesis 6. The um, uh, the giants are in the earth in those days, and uh, God sees that the earth is being overrun by these entities. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of information on this, but the book of First Enoch does. The first 36 chapters of First Enoch, called the Book of the Watchers, kind of explains, goes into some depth in what kind of sins they were committing and their punishment. And so they were sent to the underworld. This is confirmed by 2 Peter 2 and Jude 6 and 7. They're in chains in gloomy darkness. Peter specifically says they're in Tartarus. Um, interestingly, this is paralleled by all of the stories from ancient Mesopotamia, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, the Hurrians, the Hittites, uh, the, the Akkadians, the Sumerians, who believed that their old gods, the original gods, had at some point been either banished or moved to the netherworld. Right. Okay. That's sort of the fake news version, the stories <laughs> that we get from the Greeks of right. Zeus and the Olympians overthrowing Kronos and the Titans and sending the destruction. That's the fake news version to explain why these old gods no longer walk the earth. The Bible just very simply says these angels who sinned are in chains until the judgment. Right. And of course, we know in Revelation chapter 9, they get out. These things come out of the bottomless pit. That's who's in there. It's the titans of the Greeks. Okay. The, uh, the Hurrians called them the former gods. Right. The uh, Sumerians called them the Anunnaki. Right. Okay, the Anunnaki were not the ancient astronauts. These are the old gods, angels, who God punished for inter interfering in human affairs right. in a forbidden way. Yeah. They're in Tartarus. Okay, that was the second rebellion. And now, how do they influence the world to this day? I kind of addressed that in the second coming of Saturn, tried to speculate on that, because, again, I identify, identify Saturn, Kronos of the Greeks, El of the Canaanites as Molech. To the Hebrews, he was the one who God warned Moses and the Israelites, do not pass your children through the fire. In other words, don't sacrifice them and burn them as an offering yeah. to this God, Molech. Yeah. And yet many did. The uh, Phoenicians, the Carthaginians were infamous for doing this. Mm. They found the Tophet at Carthage, which is in Tunisia today, North Africa. Mm. Uh, they found Tophets on the island of Sicily and Sardinia in the Mediterranean with thousands of little children under the age of two 
okay. burned and buried in, in jars. Why would they do this? And how could they do it if this God who was demanding the sacrifice is in chains in Tartarus? Well, we don't know exactly how that works, right. but how is it possible that a, a gang leader or a mafia boss can still control action on the streets when he's in prison? That's it. It's got minions, yes. demonic minions. That's again, that's speculation. We don't know for sure, but that's, that's our guess. That's how I think they're still influencing the world to this day. The key to understanding the state of the world today is the Tower of Babel incident and what Dr. Michael Heiser called the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Right. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, Moses telling the Israelites their history. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, there's a belief, as we mentioned earlier, in fact, right. uh, you re referenced it in our book, the 70 sons of El living on Mount Hermon. And again, this is just a belief that 70 means all of them. So right. all the gods of the nations are the sons of El. But when you go back to Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations in the Bible, and you count the number of nations that are mentioned there, the descendants of Noah, there are 70. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that there are 70 ethnicities necessarily. What it means is they all come from Noah. Right. Okay. And, but it's not a coincidence that you've got that same number repeated in Genesis 10. The Canaanites who believe that all the gods of the nations met with their father god, El, on the summit of Mount Hermon. And we also see in uh, the story of Jesus right after the transfiguration, which, by the way, took place on the summit of Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. When you read the biblical account carefully, you see this happened right after. Right. Peter made his confession at Caesarea Philippi, the base of the mountain. Six days later, Peter, James, Jude, or Peter, James, and John accompany Jesus up the mountain for the transfiguration. Then when they come down, Jesus casts uh, the demon out of a possessed boy, and then he sends 70 disciples ahead of him into the Galilee. Right. Essentially saying, my 70 are more powerful than your 70. Your 70. Love it. Yeah. So this is essentially what it is. After the Tower of Babel, God divided the nations, and he allotted to the nations these angels. That's really an imprecise term, but I guess that, uh, that, right. that will have to do uh, these lesser Elohim as the gods of the nations. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. God is warning Moses, beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven... You'll be drawn away and bow down and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Mm. In other words, God divided the nations and gave them these lesser Elohim, these angels, to sort of supervise in, in the same way um, as the Israelites when they demanded a king in the book of Judges in uh, 1 Samuel. We want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. And God said to Samuel, okay, anoint Saul, right. but tell the Israelites that um, I'll give them what they want, but they're not going to like it. It's essentially the same thing that happened after Babel. Right. Babel was an attempt to build an artificial mountain because it was believed in the ancient world that mountains were the abodes of the gods. This is where the gods met. Right. They were going to build an artificial mountain as a point of contact to bring the gods down to earth. I mean... I would argue that even 5,000 years ago, uh, engineers in ancient Sumer understood they were never going to build a mud brick tower tall enough to reach heaven. That right. was not the purpose. It was a cult center right. intended to serve as a point of contact between heaven and earth. And God said, okay, if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. I'm going to confuse your languages and split you up. You'll be under the uh, administration of these angelic beings but yeah. I'm reserving one people for myself. And that's verse nine of Deuteronomy 32. Israel or Jacob is his inheritance, his allotted portion. So after Babel, God said, okay, here you go. You angels, you oversee the earth. And of course, Psalm 82 is God's judgment on those angels for judging and right. ruling unjustly. Right. Yeah. And I love that you went through that because that's exactly what I was going to ask next about Deuteronomy 32, uh, Psalm uh, 82 as well, they all connect. And then at the same time, when you read them and you don't know the basis or the foundation of everything you just explained, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Right, right. 
No, because it's weird. And um, because most of us in the Western world, here in the United States especially, but in the Western world generally, we are raised with a naturalistic bias. Right. We look for we look for naturalistic explanations. Right. Okay, the prophets and the apostles, yeah, okay, they were pretty smart guys and they could write pretty well. Isaiah was a, uh, you know, had a way with words, but they didn't really understand the way they they attributed to the to the to the gods things that were happening in the natural realm, you know, weather, yeah. earthquakes, whatever. Um it's like, no, I I think we're doing a disservice. We're it's really um we, we've been pulled away from the understanding of the world that the apostles and the prophets had. And so all we're trying to do is get, we're not trying to create some weird new way to make right. the Bible exciting. We're just trying to get back to understanding the word of God, the way the prophets and the apostles did. That's right. That's right. And centuries ago for it all, it all, like I said, in the beginning, it all begins to connect. It all begins to um, be clearer for the Christian to understand this. Why? Because how many, how many, times as as a as a christian and you know call it a baby christian or whatever we're always talking about the enemy referring to satan as you know the enemy and 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 we we want to put satan or the enemy as omnipresent like he's everywhere and he's attacking us oh i'm getting an attack from the enemy and you know oh, so and so is getting an attack from the enemy the like if the enemy is omnipresent and he's not the en enemy is not omnipresent uh, we have to understand that there are the, these demonic entities at work. And so when, you know, when you talk about the fallen, those that rebelled against God, and then you talk about the Nephilim, um, it, is there a difference? Help us understand, is there a difference? Because, I mean, I know obviously what uh, Enoch has to say. I know what, you know, um, uh, historians like... Um, Josephus had to say and and whatnot, but explain that to our listening audience is that there's there's a difference right between the dead spirits of the Nephilim and this fallen angelic realm in the in a sense. Right. The uh, yeah, there, there's there's not much that we've been taught in, in the church about. Uh, I guess you'd call it angelology or demonology. Yeah. And we we could really stand for some good uh, teachings in those regards. And right. you know, to bring Mike Heiser back into the conversation again. His yeah. books, uh, Angels and Demons, are really good yeah. um, academic reference materials for a study of angels and demons and what the Bible has to say right. about them. But in, an, in a nutshell, these fallen angels rebelled against God. You essentially have two groups. You've got the group that uh, are mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God. They're called watchers. But uh, there's also there are also faithful watchers who are mentioned very briefly in Daniel chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where the watchers decree the punishment to Nebuchadnezzar for his pride. It's like uh, uh, they, they uh, in fact, they apparently have some authority because his punishment was by the decree, the decision of the watchers. watchers so right. watcher apparently is a, a category or class of angelic being. Um, anyway, this group that rebelled prior to uh, the flood of Noah, who were um, committed the, this, the sin of crossing the species barrier, apparently, they're down in, the tar they're down in Tartarus. The right. second group of, of rebels are apparently among the group that God delegated authority for overseeing earth after the Tower of Babel incident. Um, those are, again, those are fallen angels. Demons are fundamentally different. They are, um, what's the scholarly word, ontologically different. Right. Uh, those are the spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood. And what blew my mind in, in researching Last Clash of the Titans was discovering, it, mentioning the scholar uh, Amar Anus again, that in Hebrew, in, in uh, Greek writings, rather, the, uh, the Greek poets Homer and Hesiod used a term for the demigod heroes of the pre-flood age mm -hmm. that... Um, showed that they understood that the daemons, the, the spirits of the men from that age, when they died, their spirits became these daemons or demons. That's right. um, it's just they had a much better view of them than, than Jews and, and uh, Christians did. Uh, the Greek daemon was a spirit that could intercede for you and do good things for you, but you had to sacrifice to them. You had, had to offer them sacrifices at their, their cult centers. And again, this is very much like the um, the veneration of the Rephaim mm -hmm. 
performed by the Canaanites and the, the Amorites yeah. uh, in ancient Mesopotamia. So uh, finding that, uh, you know, Homer and Hesiod, who lived at about the same time as the prophet Isaiah, roughly, were writing about these, uh, these men of the Golden Age, and that uh, Hesiod in particular, who uh, is the source of a lot of what we know about Greek religion, that uh, they that they they understood that the these spirits the daemons were the spirits of these hybrid demigods who died in the flood. Yeah. I was like, that's mind blowing, yeah. because it's one thing to read this from a Christian or Jewish perspective, and to say, okay, yeah, but they're just trying to you know, or a skeptic can say they're just yeah. trying to demonize, pardon the pun, the yeah. religious beliefs of their neighbors. But the Greeks are saying, no, no, this is where they come from. It's just that they're good. They're nice. They're kindly. They're helpful. Mm. Whereas Jews and Christians are saying, no, this is where they came from. Right. The spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood are the demons that Jesus was casting out during his ministry. The demons that deliverance ministers deal with to this day, Yes, uh, that's where they come from. And again, this was the universal understanding. This was the consensus of the earliest church theologians for the first 400 years. It was understood. This is where they came from. Angels mated with humans, their hybrid children, killed in the flood, their spirits, demons. Yeah. And then Augustine came along and said, no, that's that's too weird. Let's, let's change all this up. And since then, again, there's been confusion in the church as to what these things are. When we go back to what the early church believed, to what the Jews of the first temple or the second temple period believed, yeah, it was it was clear to them. We just had the waters muddied over the last sixteen hundred years or so. Yeah, and if we don't really grasp that, then we don't understand some of the things that Jesus did, where mm -hmm. he went, the things that he said, uh, the specific wording that he uses. Just like you said a moment ago, uh, you were. You were preaching a message I gave uh, some time ago about uh, him asking Peter, who do you say that I am? And how he made that right. declaration that he was the son of the living God. And upon this rock, I will build my, build my church and all of that. I, I absolutely love that um, that sermon. But uh, if we don't know that, then we don't understand some of the things that Jesus said and did and where he actually went. It was so specific. Yeah. He went to several places at, or everywhere he stepped foot on it was deliberate mm -hmm. it was he he did it for a purpose he did it for a reason he said the things he said for a reason he went to the places that he went for a reason and that that brings me to remembrance of um i know that you and sharon just went recently to israel and uh and and i'd love to pick your brain on that but you um had spoken in a couple of podcasts that I heard, I think it was maybe on Blurry Creatures and, and some others, um, you talked about the value of the shadow of death. And I, I would love for you within the next few minutes before we end up closing in a little while, would you attack that? Because I would love for our listening audience to uh, basically understand the fact that that is a real place. So when we, yeah. when we say that Psalm, it is an actual real place. Can you go into that a little bit? Well, this this really blew our minds. Uh, and this has kind of developed over the last uh, year or so as we've been uh, looking into this a little bit more. There are a lot of megalithic structures all over uh, right. Israel. Megalith j is just a really big rock. So really big structures um, all over Israel. We, we visited Gilgal Rephaim a couple of times now. That's a, a massive structure on the Golan Heights that's uh, uh, dated to about 3750 BC, standard dating of archaeologists. But bottom line is it's, it's way older than the pyramids. It's way older than Stonehenge in, in uh, Britain. It's got more than twice as much stone as Stonehenge. Yeah. Okay. So somehow almost 6,000 years ago, you had a civilization living in, on the Golan Heights that, that created this, this massive structure. It huh. clearly had a religious purpose. And according to the archaeologist, who we spent an entire day with, Dr. Michael Friedman, who's done the most recent excavations there, it was in all likelihood for the cult of the dead. So now we're talking almost a thousand years before the invention of writing. This massive, incredibly well-engineered structure uh, within sight of Mount Hermon. Um, and so we, we visited that location. We also visited a, a site at the northeast corner of the, uh, the Hula Valley. Now it's H-U-L-E-H. -E this is the valley that the Jordan River runs through between Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Scholars have found as they, they've 
over the last 55 years as they've surveyed the Golan Heights, you know, Israel took it from Syria in the 1967 war. They found that the hills around this valley, which uh, until the 1950s, when the Israelis drained it, was a, it was a swamp. So you couldn't really build anything in the, on the valley. It was uh, just basically a wetland. But on the hills on either side, the Golan Heights to the east, the uh, mountains of Naphtali on the west, are what they call dolmens. Mm -hmm. uh, dolmens are these megalithic funerary monuments. Uh, the name comes from Britonic, that's a Celtic language, and it means table, because most of them look like tables. You've got two massive slabs of stone with a tabletop across the top. Those are the simplest forms. Many of them on the Golan Heights then um, are covered with stone on top of it to make a big cairn, but that's the basic structure, a big trolithon, two big slabs, vertical slabs, and then a tabletop. Uh, this one that we visited has a 50-ton capstone. A 50, that is two fully loaded 18-wheel tractor trailers. And somehow, 5,000 years ago, in Israel, they managed to lever this stone up on top of the vertical slabs. Wow. There are more than a thousand of them around this valley. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Caesarea Philippi is at the north end of the Jordan River at the foot of Mount Hermon. The south end of the Jordan, of course, uh, entries into the Sea of Galilee. That's where the uh, city of Capernaum is located, where Jesus based his ministry. Now, where did Jesus get baptized? This is a question Christians have been trying to, Christians have been trying to figure out for 2,000 years. <clears throat> we assume that because Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned the Judean wilderness. We mm -hmm. assume it's, you know, Qumran, somewhere near Jerusalem, near the Dead Sea. The Gospel of John gives more precise and specific locational information. Okay. John, the baptizer, confronted by scribes and uh, Levites sent from the Pharisees, sent by the Pharisees in Jerusalem. And uh, John answers them, you know, I'm not the, uh, I'm, I'm not the Christ, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. Um, Anyway, uh, John says in John 1, verse 28, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now, across the Jordan means east of the Jordan River. The only Bethany in the Holy Land is the one on the Mount of Olives. That is very much west of the Jordan River. It's just across the Kidron Valley from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Okay. So people have been trying to figure this out for 2,000 years. The consensus by scholars is that it's a site near Jericho, and in fact, the kingdom of Jordan is spending like $300 million to develop this site now into a tourist location. God bless them. But to quote Sala from Indiana Jones, they are digging in the wrong place. <laughs> John 1 29. Okay. John gives now a timestamp. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. All right. And then he says, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. That happened, of course, when Jesus was baptized. Yeah. Now we go to verse 35. John the, gospel, John the Apostle gives another timestamp. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Well, one of those disciples was Andrew, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. Right. Andrew goes to get Simon Peter, said, Hey, we found the Christ. Then Jesus calls Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Bethsaida is a mile and a half north of the Sea of Galilee. Andrew and Peter, we know from the Gospels, the uh, Synoptic Gospels, were partners in a fishing business with James and John on the Sea of Galilee. Now, what are the odds that Andrew would be following John the baptizer as a disciple if John was baptizing near Jericho 90 miles away? Mm -hmm. Now, today, 90 miles is a road trip. We'll go to the outlet mall for you know 90 mile drive great we'll be there in two hours right back in the day it would take a week to walk that across rough terrain wow no john was baptizing north of the sea of galilee now in 1877 an archaeologist working for the palestine exploration fund wrote that bethany in the greek bethania is probably a transliteration of the first century roman name botania which was the name of the region north and east of the Sea of Galilee, Bashan, the ancient kingdom of Og of Bashan, a region that is so covered with these dolmens 
that the Israeli archaeologist who's led the survey of the Golan Heights says, we can't even use the term dolmen field anymore because we can't tell where one field ends and the next one begins. For all intents and purposes, the ancient kingdom of Bashan is one giant dolmen field. Mm -hmm. In other words, one giant necropolis, okay. the cult of the dead, is, is basically enshrined in that ancient land. Now, we go to Matthew chapter 4, and here's what really made our heads explode. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, this is beginning of verse 12, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. Capernaum is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's about a mile from Bethsaida. In the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And now he quotes Isaiah chapter 9, which is that messianic prophecy that includes the very famous line, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He quotes, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, that's the Roman road, the Via Maris, that ran from Egypt up to the Sea of Galilee, up along the Jordan River, halfway to Mount Hermon, and then it cuts off to the northeast towards Damascus, right through ancient Bashan. Okay, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, east of the Jordan River, Galilee of the Gentiles. Here's the money quote, verse 16. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For Matthew this fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, people dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Now again, the Jordan River runs through this valley that is ringed by a thousand dolmens. Wow. Jesus moving there was bringing a light to the region and the shadow of death. And it was through that valley that Jesus went from his home base at Capernaum to lead his disciples to Caesarea Philippi at the foot of Mount Hermon, <laughs> to say, who do people say the Son of Man is? And now who do you say that I am? And then he climbs Mount Hermon to declare his divinity to the spirit realm with the transfiguration. So yes, we think that valley between Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee is the valley of the shadow of death. And when you think about Psalm 22 and the verses in there, and I heard Sharon give this presentation at a church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee a few years ago. And when she because she described it this way, and she'd explained what a dolmen was and what they looked like. And then she read Psalm 23. <laughs> Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table, a dolmen before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> it's like, it just it's blows like your mind. man. Jesus declared war on the spirits of the, de the demonic spirits oh, of yeah. the dead right from the beginning of his ministry with where he chose to be baptized. Yes. Where he declared his divinity. Yes. And again, from there, after the transfiguration, he began to make his way to uh, Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. Who ever said the Bible was boring? I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's only because we've been taught that most of the uh, the characters in it, the giants, the gods, and the dragons are imaginary. Yeah. Once we understand, hey, look, this is like Lord of the Rings on steroids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Because it's real. Right, right. You're absolutely right. Oh, my goodness. I love that. I love how the Bible just comes to life. And then not only that, you, we know you know, these bits and pieces of the Old Testament and how they just connect with the New Testament, everything that Jesus did, everything the, the from the healing to the things that he, you know, said and, 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 oh, it's just, I love how that just connects. To me, it gets me so excited, Derek, so excited. And it's that passion that I have to just share the word of God with people. And, you know, I, I get it that as pastors, you want to make the word of God, uh, you know, relevant to this day and age. And, and of course we can do that in, in, in certain ways, you know, when God speaks to us and stuff, but really we miss, we miss the meat of it. If we don't dive into subjects such as these. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh. Well, I, 
I wish I could stay with you longer. I know you have to go. Um, but is there uh, anything new that you're working on that you want to uh, talk to us about for just the next uh, few seconds before we close? And what I would love for you to do is to share with our audience where they can support your work, where they can find you, and then just you know close in prayer for us, if you don't mind. Thank you. We are working on a book called The Gates of Hell, which okay. will go into this in, in some depth. We're also putting together a video based on our recent uh, expedition to Israel to show uh, what it is we saw when we visited right. Gilgal Rephaim, this, this um, you know megalithic structure on the Golan Heights, the uh, serpent mound of Bashan, which we didn't even talk about, which is a quarter of a mile away from Gilgal Rephaim. It makes the serpent mound in Ohio look like a, look like a worm. It's uh, three quarters of a mile long, 25 feet high, 200 feet wide, and it's covered with 140 megalithic tombs. Wow. All the tombs in this region between there and Gilgal Rephaim are on the back of this serpent-shaped ridge, which may be a natural formation, but it doesn't change the fact that it was clearly used for a religious purpose. Right. And the fact is you've got this three quarter of a mile long serpent shaped structure covered with megalithic burials wow. in a place called Bashan, which literally in the ancient language means place of the serpent. Hmm. So yeah, that'll be part of the video that we're putting together on this whole um, series of, I, I, I hesitate to call them discoveries because God has certainly known that these things are all there. It's just, you know, putting together the evidence uh, but just sharing the excitement we have about that, those will all, both be out before uh, the end of the year. Um, and the, people can follow our work. We, we produce about four, four and a half hours of content a week between our, our weekly broadcast program, Unraveling Revelation, where we study end times prophecy. Uh, we got two podcasts, my weekly interview program, A View from the Bunker, PID Radio, which stands for Peering into Darkness, that's the podcast that we began back in 2005, and our weekly Bible study. Uh, the Gilbert House Fellowship, which is uh, audio only. We just go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order. Mm -hmm. And we try to dig out these, these kind of nuggets. Um, and there are a lot more in there than we realized. We've been through the Bible all the way once. We're going through it for the second time now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, we're, we're, we're going through much more slowly than we did the first time because right. we're seeing more than we just like, hey, was this in here the last time? Because I don't remember <laughs> this. But that's the thing about the Bible. You never run out of things to never. discover. Yeah. And it's uh, it, it really is a joy to yeah. do what we do. Well, thank you. For and you can find all of that at uh, gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. Okay, fantastic. And people can follow Skywatch from there and everything, correct? They can uh, uh, Skywatch t uh, TV? skywatchtv.com. Yeah, for the daily yeah. news updates, skywatchtv.com. Very good, very good. Would you close this out in prayer? Yeah. Today? Father, thank you for granting us this time today, and thank you for granting us each another day. We, we know that we are not guaranteed any time at all on this earth. So, Lord, each day that we have from you is a gift, regardless of what's happening. And we just pray that you'll help us to make the most of the time that you have blessed us with, using the, the gifts, the talents that you have um, given to us to... Uh, to honor you, to lift up Christ and him crucified, as Paul wrote. Lord, we see the darkness rising in this world, but your, your light will eventually yes. overwhelm the darkness. Mm. We are here at this time. You have placed us here at this point in history for your reasons. Help us to find the purpose to which you've called us and then to run the race with all of our strength while we still draw breath. We ask for your blessing, Father, especially for those who are preaching the gospel in, in places where doing so is a threat to, uh, to life and limb. We pray for those who are struggling emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically this day, Lord, that you would bring comfort and healing. Lord, you have blessed us beyond measure. We know a day is coming when you will return and restore this world to justice, bring justice to this world, true justice, Father. Until then, Lord, give us the words to speak when the opportunities present, to share the hope that we have in you with gentleness and respect, Lord. We pray for your spirit to grant us wisdom and discernment, boldness, and also, Lord, the grace to love sacrificially as you have loved us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. We have to get you back on and uh, dive into other uh, topics that maybe we didn't dive into today for sure. I have so many more questions. So, but thank you again. I do appreciate it so much and we'll see you again. So for our listening audience, be sure to share this with your friends and your family and follow along with us and follow uh, Derek and his ministry as well. And you can uh, support his ministry also by getting all these great books and great materials. So God bless you all. Take care. And thanks again for joining us. God bless.